Shrug, and we have a store there with a cafe there now. And uh, back in 1989, nothing was going on, really, on Miami Beach to the point where the Miami Herald had a headline story that said, Books and Books Moves to Miami Beach. And we presented, our first writer there was Ann Rice, who was presented at the book show for a signing that went on for about 12 hours, you see. And Ann told me a very remarkable story. Ann had a sister who disappeared and became sort of a street woman. And Ann discovered before she came to our reading, she had, she had rediscovered her sister, brought her sister back to New Orleans, and rediscovered her and got her kind of on the straight and narrow. And her sister told her before she came to our bookstore that her sister was homeless on Lincoln Road and that she used to sleep outside our bookstore at night back in the 80s, early 90s. I mean, it's just sort of strange kinds of, uh, kinds of synergy. So we opened the store in 1989 on Lincoln Road, and then we opened the store in Bal Harbor about six or seven years ago. So we have three stores that we own, and then we have four stores that are affiliated as Books and Books bookshops. There's one in the Cayman Islands, where I had all my money. There's, uh, there's one in West Hampton Beach, where I built this gigantic mansion right on the on um, We also have one in the airport, where my private jet is one. Uh, and then we have one in the Fort Lauderdale Museum, which also took my collection of dollies. So those are the other four bookshops that we have. Um, and now, at this point, Books and Books puts on about 700 events a year. Many of you in this room have been to some of them. I recognize lots of faces. Many of you have read at some of our, have been uh, guest authors at our events. Um, and, you know, I couldn't have imagined, uh, you know, when I started out this odyssey, you know, reading the Dharma Bum so many years ago, that I would end up doing something that would keep me as connected to literary culture as this has. And being able to do this in my own hometown makes it that much sweeter. Um, so that's a little bit about how I, how I became a bookseller. The, the next question is, why am I still in business? That's a, that's a much longer discussion. I hope we're going to be able to deal with some of that during the Q&A, because I'm sure a lot of you have that same kind of question. Because what's always asked of me is, what's going to happen with books now that there are e-books? What's, uh, you know, what's going to happen to the written word? Uh, what's going to happen to narrative, to story? How are we going to tell stories? Are they going to be told in a linear way? Are we going to use multimedia uh, in order to tell stories? Just what's going to happen along those, those lines? And if that happens, and there are no books as we know them, what will happen to you as a bookstore? Well, the short answer for me is there are going to be books around at least for the next 20 years. And after that, it's all your problem. <laughs> That's the short answer to be honest. I will, our bookstore will be vibrant for the next 20 years at least. Um, I don't think books are disappearing overnight. Uh, I don't think that stories are disappearing. I think the more you look at things today, the more you realize that people are hungering for more story. I think what we're dealing with right now in our culture is a distribution issue. It's really not an issue of whether there should be books or not be books. It's how you get your content that is being sort of discussed and, and, and dealt with. And I think that is a separate track and a separate issue as to whether or not there will be bookstores. But I firmly believe that people like to congregate. I really believe in the notion of the great good place. I believe that people like coming to places and interacting. They like coming to places in order to have a sense of discovery. Where else, it's very hard to browse on the internet. I don't care how many times you click that stumble upon button, you may not find that thing you want. But if you come into one of our stores and you develop a relationship with one of our booksellers who knows your taste, you're gonna know that you're gonna, you're gonna be able to trust that they will find something for you to read, something that will stimulate you, something that will change your life. And so as long as there is that, what I think, that continued sense and need for people to get together that need for place, bookstores will still be around. But make no mistake, it's not something that is guaranteed. When I started in this business 30 years ago, there were over 7,000 members of the American Booksellers Association, which is the trade organization of independent bookstores like mine. Today, there are fewer than 1,500 members. 
So what you see in Miami with books and books is fairly unique. And the reason why we're here is because of the support of you guys. We, there's, there's no reason for us to be here other than the support that you give. So, you know, while I'm hopeful that bookstores will be around, they're gonna take lots of nurturing. And then the good news that I can report tonight is that that nurturing is beginning to take shape. With the demise of places like Borders and these big chains that are having a rough time, in their wake, you're seeing lots of younger people opening bookshops. Brooklyn, for instance, in one part of Brooklyn, there are like nine or 10 <coughs> bookstores right there. There's a woman who opened a bookstore in uh, Athens, Georgia, where the University of Georgia is. So there's no bookstore there. They, this young woman raised the money uh, and opened a little bookstore called Avid Books. The author, Ann Patchett, decided that she would open her own bookstore in Nashville, where there was no bookstore. So the idea of independent, homegrown stuff is beginning to take root. Just the way in cooking, like the slow food movement, uh, the, the local movements all over the place are beginning to take shape. These are all sort of hand in hand. So I am, for one, very, very hopeful that we will continue to be in business and that uh, 20, 30 years from now, you know, maybe another bookseller will be standing up here telling another group about how they got started you know, in this very business. So I thank you for, for listening tonight. And uh, I'd love for there to be a dialogue with it could be as well and would entertain any questions that any of you might have. Selling, what's not selling. How do you keep up with all the, all the literature that comes through? I read every single book in the picture. Twice. No. <laughs> <laughs> what happens is that, like any sales thing, what we do is, you know, selling books, buying books, it's really an art, not a science. So I've been doing it for 30 years now. So I do all the buying of what we call the new books, the front list books in the store mostly. And, you know, you become. You know, it's the, you know, I read all of the, the journals, all the periodicals, the reviews. I also see sales reps three times a year who show me what's coming out. And then I know the good editors, the editors who write books that, I mean, who publish books that have done well for us. But then there are surprises. I don't know if any of you know what the best-selling book in America is right now. Does anyone know, other than those who know? <laughs> okay, it's a book called Fifty Shades of Grey. Have you heard of that book? Okay, this is, this is like, it's a phenomenon. An absolute, I've, I've not seen this since Harry Potter, to be honest with you. It's the Harry Potter or Twilight for older women who are looking to re-explore their sexuality and sensuality. It's a book that takes place, it was self-published as a fan, uh, you, know, you know what fan, what fan fiction is? Mm -hmm. Any of you hear about that? It's where you take like Twilight and you reimagine it in some particular way. Well, this woman who's British reimagined Twilight as if it were pornography, basically. And had all the characters doing these pornographic things. Well, lo and behold, it caught on like wildfire. <laughs> so she said, wait a minute, I'm not charging for this. I gotta figure out a way to charge for it. So she stripped away all of the Twilight stuff out of it and wrote her own story around it. A compelling story that's kind of a love story uh, and there's some redemption at the end. And she kept in, she kept in a lot of the sex, the sex scenes, which really sold it. So it's basically a novel that's about S and M. Uh, it's amazing to me that in the days of Rick Santorum, in the days of all this, it's selling millions of copies. And she did it by herself. She self-published this thing to the point where two months ago, Random House bought the rights for like a couple million dollars. So overnight this woman became a millionaire. And she's now selling <coughs> film rights as well. And it's like remarkable. So the idea that people don't want a story is not right at all. And the idea that, that something that strikes a chord won't bubble up is not right either. And so it's just really interesting to me to see this phenomenon going on now. And um, they're, you know, they're, 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 it's very hopeful, I think. I mean, I know a lot of writers who are not happy about it. You know, like, oh, this woman's making all this money, I slave away for 
years and years <laughs> writing a novel and she just throws this off. And, but that's what happened. And, uh, in, in Royal Gables, I, especially, I, I browse books that are in English and Spanish. That's also very characteristic of Miami, you know, the, the, the bilingual. So, as a as a as a book man, you have to you know, you're, and you're a book buyer. You have to get into the minds of lingos, but you have to get into the Hispanic mind as well. And so, I was just wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, no, it's a very interesting thing in Miami. I mean, I would say over fifty percent of our customers are of of uh, Latino descent, Hispanic descent. Fifty percent. Many of them have English as their first language, or primarily read in English, uh, or many of them are also bilingual. So they want to read in the language that it was originally written in. So what we do is, on the Spanish books that we bring in, it's primarily, if, if Mario Vargas Llosa has a new novel, we'll sell probably more copies of his novel in Spanish than we will in English. The same with Isabel Allende. We'll sell more in Spanish you know, than we will in English. So that's kind of the, our approach. We don't sell, interestingly enough, lots of stuff that's just purely in translation like the new John Grisham in translation, won't sell that much for us. Because I think people walking into our bookstore are familiar with English, one way or another. There are and have been a history of a number of Spanish-only bookstores in Miami. Unfortunately, a lot of those have gone the way of the internet. Because the internet has had a huge impact on specialty bookstores. That's why you don't see very many children's bookstores anymore. That's why you don't see very many mystery bookstores because you can find it all sort of on the internet if you have a particular specialty. So a lot of Spanish speakers go to the internet to find their books. I used to go to a bookstore in New York City that had, speaking of specialty bookstores, that specialized only in books in Catalan. Is that right? Yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. <clears throat> Is there any other questions? Yeah. So it seems like a bit of a segue into what I was wondering. Uh, to my knowledge, Books and Books doesn't sell any used books. Was that a conscious business decision to not branch into that, or do you think like the internet deals in that business enough? That's a really good question. I mean, we actually do sell some used books, not a lot, but we sell some. Um, yeah, it became a conscious decision to move away from used books because of the internet. Mm -hmm. If you go on the internet right now, you can literally find any used book just about that you want if you go to AB com or any of those places. So we were, two things were happening. One, it was hard to find good used books because lots of people were selling them on the internet. And secondly, it was very hard to compete on price on the internet for a used book. So what we've tried to do is carry some specialty used books. So we have some first editions. We also have some art books. The other thing we'll do is we've done it for a number of people that had very interesting collections that they didn't want to sell off just a book dealer who wouldn't give them a lot of money for it. So we would take their collection into our store and we would sell it and then just split it with them, which gave them a little bit of an annuity as well, if the collection was interesting enough. Interesting enough. But the internet has, has, has eaten into a lot of that. I think he had a question that I was going to like. I was just wondering, what kind of advice would you have for a young person uh, today that's just beginning to get into the book trade? Um, I guess more so on, uh, on, on publishing it and uh, book making and books as a craft from your perspective as a, as a, as a seller and, and just understanding the, the industry as a whole. Well, there's a couple of ways to do it. Um, if you're looking at it from a publishing perspective, uh, there are a couple of really good publishing <coughs> workshops that are given. Stanford has one, Denver University has one, and Columbia has one. And these are six-week programs that you can go to in the summer, and you can learn all you want to learn about publishing. And a lot of people who break into publishing go to one of those things, and then usually find a job in the publishing world in some way. If you're thinking of books as art, more or less, or individual books, or you know, the craft of book making, that's a whole other world. And, and, and books as art actually is a kind of very interesting thing. And there, there are a couple places you can go for that. There's a place in New York called Clifton Battle. You could probably, you know that? Yeah. If you go there, you know, that could lead you down all kinds of roads. In fact, at Art Basel every year, they also have a book on that, and you can find stuff there as well. Uh, so that would be maybe the route that I would take, and maybe apprentice with somebody who could teach you something. Michael? Uh, Mr. Could you, could you tell us 
talk a little bit about your own publishing project, like let's just look at a private railroad. Sure. One of the things that we did as a bookstore in following the, uh, the tradition of some of the other bookstores is we decided to get into publishing. And there were two projects that we did this year. One was with Les Sanderson. Les has written uh, a marvelous book called Last Train to Paradise. It's a book which tells the story of Henry Flagler and the building of the railroad from New York that went all the way to Havana, believe it or not. And it's really the story of the opening of Florida as a, a tourist thing. He really was responsible for the development of the whole east coast of Florida through the, uh, through the railway, railway. And Les tells this story in such a compelling, remarkable way. This is a man in his 70s who started this, this, this crazy thing to build an overseas railway in Key West, fought through hurricanes and illness and all kinds of stuff. So Les wrote that book a number of years ago. And it did really well. I think it sold a couple hundred thousand copies, if not more. Uh, in fact, in Palm Beach, they have it this month as the citywide read is Les's book. Well, it turns out that 1912 is when the train reached Key West. And so 2012 was